Um, all right, so uh, part two, where did the Green Party come from? What's a short history of the Green Party? We talked about the values of the party and some of the platforms, um, but of course, where did it come from? Um, the Green Party has um, kind of a, a long trajectory here. Um, there's some stuff that kind of fed into what became the Green Party. And then of course, now there is the Green Party. Um, so really, if you trace it back, it goes all the way back to around the 1950s. Um, in those uh, very kind of turbulent years around the 1960s, you had various social movements pop up um, to fight for justice and, and equality and, and all. So, you know, you had the civil rights movement, you had a uh, feminist movement, you had an environmental movements, you had peace anti-war movements. And these all came up to, um, to protest and fight against uh, various problems in US society, US culture that existed at the time. And um, all of them made important gains in, in uh, social justice um, and environmentalism and, and peace and all uh, in that time period. Um, but kind of after certain reforms were made, um, all of those movements found themselves being kind of marginalized. They ended up becoming co-opted by um, uh, essentially the Democratic Party, uh, which, which um, has made a habit of that for decades now, that when, uh, when leftist leaning movements start growing, and demanding more power, the Democrats swoop in and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we got this. We're, we're cool. You know, we'll, hand, we'll take it from here. Don't worry about it. And then they, they do the corporate agenda and they don't actually listen to those movements. Um, so veterans out of those movements uh, came together and said, you know, um, we have to do like uh, movements in history have done and build our own independent, you know, um, political party for the people, for the working class in order to represent those issues um, because we're not being represented by the, the two-party corporate oligarchy. So, um, you know, it eventually led into uh, the 1980s it forming the, uh, what was called the Green Communities of Correspondence, which uh, began discussing the, the possibility of forming a Green Party in particular because of um, uh, various world events um, in Australia and then eventually uh, Germany. Uh, they, they started political movements um, centered around the same sort of issues of civil rights, feminism, environmentalism, peace, uh, things like that. Um, they started forming political parties um, in those countries and started winning elections and winning office and, and starting to gain um, electoral power. And that was, of course, very exciting for people in the U.S. that maybe we can recreate that here. So um, folks began talking about forming a Green Party. Uh, there were various discussions. Um, some states uh, started trying to kind of test the waters and run some candidates in the uh, early 1980s. Um, but the Green Party as kind of a, a whole big organization didn't emerge until about 1991 when the, uh, the first Greens, Green Party USA, was, uh, was founded. And it was originally founded by um, uh, uh, various... Uh, folks that were known as the, the left greens, green, yeah, left greens. Um, and that included like Howie Hawkins, but also included some other names such as um, Murray Bookchin. And I include a picture of one of his most famous books here, uh, The Ecology of Freedom. Uh, Bookchin was a important uh, kind of political philosopher and historian that uh, tried to combine together socialist ideas with ideas of environment and ecology in a way that was going to create a more um, liberatory political philosophy um, that pushed toward, um, well, the ecology of freedom, right? Pushed toward a society that was based in freedom, but also based in ecology, based in a, you know, a sustainable, healthy harmony with, with nature. Um, and, and this was actually a fairly radical uh, turning point in history that um, you can learn more about in our Socialism 101, <laughs> another plug for it. Uh, it was an interesting turning point because um, a lot of socialist movements up to that point had kind of ignored environmentalism that they um, either it was completely ignored or even if it was acknowledged, it was kind of a secondary aspect to socialist organizing principles um, and Marxist principles that it was kind of a nice to have and not really critical. And Bookchin kind of argued that no, it is critical to our organizing that we have to address ecology. We have to put our socialist movement on an ecological basis in order for us to move forward. 
So that kind of thinking is what led toward the original uh, Green Party, uh, Green Party USA, which was very focused on political education and local organizing, uh, local direct actions and local electoral campaigns and political education that was gonna reach uh, the public, reach the, the masses. Um, and then, you know, the, the popularity over the, the 90s um, grew and eventually there was an effort to say, let's try to run a presidential candidate. And that, that came in the form of Ralph Nader in 1996, uh, which spawned another thing called the Association of State Green Parties to support his presidential campaign. Um, and essentially with, with all of these, um, uh, with candidates running in states across the country and political education and the Nader campaign brought in a lot of new people. Um, you know, the, the Green Party was essentially um, born around all of those uh, struggles. And while the history is kind of complex, I'm going to way over summarize it by saying <laughs> those two organizations essentially merged in 2000 into what is now known as the Green Party of the United States. Um, so that has some interesting, um, um, what would you call it, uh, impacts on uh, what the Green Party is today um, that we'll discuss as we get a little further here. One, um, one interesting uh -huh. thing about, you know, the, the early, you know, in the first point you talk about civil rights, feminist, environmental, and peace movements coming together. Um, yep. And because it wasn't the forming of an official party and we only have so many bullet points, you don't have it in here, but in 1984 was the first green convention in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and while it, it didn't form a official green party um, politically in terms of the, the, a, a national party that's registered with the Federal Election Commission, that didn't happen until 1991, like you said. But in 1984, at that first founding meeting of the Green Party in the United States, um, delegates were sent by movements. Um, yes. You know, Howie Hawkins was one of those delegates that was there on that at that first um, that first meeting in 1984, and he was sent as a delegate of the Clamshell Alliance, which was an anti-nuclear power organization that he was a founder of. Um, you know, so the, there's a the long debate in the Green Party about electoralism, but over movements and the, the purpose of the party originally was for movements to have an electoral voice. It was never <laughs> exactly. an either or. Um, it never should have been made an either or. Um, it always was both um, to the point that our, our founder, our, our founding meeting was, um, you know, you weren't sent there by the Illinois Green Party. You were sent there by an organization that was interested in independent politics. And uh, that's then spawned um, you know, the, the official coming, what, seven years later. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and you can see it reflected in, in the pillars of the Green Party, essentially. When you look at the four pillars and compare it to the movements listed here, it's basically exactly those movements. Uh, the pillars are a recognition that actually these movements are intertwined, that they are um, essentially inseparable, that you can't have civil rights without environmental justice, you know, without being also anti-war, without being uh, feminist and anti-patriarchy. All of these issues are actually interrelated and part of kind of the same problem and have to be addressed together. So that I think was part of uh, a, kind of a key insight that these movements came together and said, we need our own political voice because we're not getting one in the duopoly. Um, I'll so also say that it's, it's one of the shortcomings long-term of the Green Party um, in that, you know, if you look at our platform, our national platform, it can often be disconnected. It can be contradictory. Um, and that's because in my opinion, we kind of remain the party of issues activists. Um, you know, the, the peace activists form peace action committee and the eco activists, the, the ecological activists, formed eco action committee and you know people who wanted to be involved in, in electoral stuff got involved in coordinated campaign committee or ballot access committee and these are all internal things we'll talk about later um but the party always in my opinion stayed to compartmentalize it yeah. didn't <laughs> develop a unified intersectional um you know culture um it, it allowed people to 
to say I'm an environmental activist, I'm a green. I'm a, I believe in Medicare for all and I am a green. And as we talked about before, um, these, these ideas even th that aren't radical, these majoritarian ideas aren't available anywhere else for the most part um, in American politics. So um, they came here and they found a home because we, we stood for their one issue, um, but we didn't we didn't, you know, form a broader, you know, green culture that was all encompassing and, and pulled people further into and out of their lanes. Um, so it, mm -hmm. we, we found it in the movements, but in my opinion, we, we stayed too segmented. Um, yeah. We, we didn't, uh, we didn't do enough political education and enough, um, you know, internal understanding of the intersectional nature of all of these, uh, you know, of our pillars and all of all of these movements. Yeah, it's an ongoing challenge to kind of meet that, um, you know, that aspiration of combining these movements into a broad mass party that's actually going to win on all of these fronts. Um, you know, and that's why we're here today. We're still building it. So we're still Especially learning from the Democrats have a history of so. giving appeasement to various mm -hmm. movements one at a time. Right. Um, right. So when all of a sudden AOC starts talking about the Green New Deal and people are drawn into the Sunrise Movement and then drawn into the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't get it. But just the primus of appeasement pulled people away from, you know, getting involved in, or in organizations that actually support what they want and, and want an independent way to get there first, getting pulled into organizations that believe that somehow capitalist institutions are one day going to, get, you know, basically end themselves because we asked nicely. Right. Um, so, you know, and it's that that plays a big part, right? Um, when, when when you stay in your movement and you get an offer from power, um, it's easy then to kind of cleave the party off, right? To to create divisions in the party because, well, they can go get something from, you know, for the issue they're here for. Um, and therefore, they may not, you know, maintain the fight for the issues that they didn't show up for. Yep. Well, that's more organizing discussion. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think this is kind of the, the basic uh, history of um, the Green Party. Uh, like we were, uh, Chris and I were just discussing, there's a lot of uh, nuance that goes into all of this that we can get into, but just kind of a short overview. Um, so you might be interested in, in folks like Murray Bookchin, for example, if you want to read more political philosophy that kind of grounds what it means to be a green socialist. Um, there's Petra Kelly, who was in the European Green Party um, after the success of the German Greens and stuff. And uh, um, her writings are really great if you want to get kind of more insight into uh, green values and what it means in practice. Um, and then I have kind of a clip down there from C-SPAN at the very bottom left here. On the day that the Green Party was originally founded, it was covered by C-SPAN. And actually on the right there, you can see uh, Howie Hawkins, who was there at the, the first press conference. And it's very fascinating to watch that. It's up on C-SPAN. If you, if you kind of Google Green Party Foundation uh, formation and you um, watch that video, I think it's about half an hour long. Um, and they talk about a lot of the same issues that we're facing today, that we have not really uh, made much progress on that. Because like Chris says, we, um, a lot of the left in the U.S. gets kind of stuck on its own individual actions and the Democratic Party can come in and co-opt it and make sure that essentially nothing happens. So the Greens still have the same criticisms today that they had, uh, that we had back then. And we're still fighting to, um, to, to make a better system. So um, it's interesting to listen to. <laughs> um, so all of this history together wraps up something Chris had mentioned that um, the Green Party is both an activist organization and an electoral party, or at least that's our aspiration. Um, a lot of folks get stuck in that kind of either or binary thinking that either I have to do direct actions, you know, ah, electoralism, it gets you nowhere, or they'll jump completely into campaigns and they'll forget that, you know, you have to build community trust, you have to build community organizations and all. So building our green movement is really about doing both. We, we understand both of them as uh, kind of two sides of the same coin. They have to go together to really create a strong movement that's going to last, you know, beyond just one electoral cycle or, you know, just, you know, beyond one project or something like that. Well, we have to keep up the fight um, 
long term if we want to make the kind of systemic changes that we're arguing for.